welcome everyone. Um, people are still joining the room. An awful lot of people have registered, which I think is a, a sign both of uh, the, the respect in which the audience hold our distinguished speaker and, and the intrinsic interest of uh, the talk uh, this evening. Uh, my name is Philip Murphy. I'm acting director of the Institute of Historical Research. And I'm delighted to uh, introduce Professor Ludmila Jordanova, who will be giving the 2021 Historical Research Lecture. Uh, Ludmilla is Professor of Visual Culture, Department of History at Durham University, and Director of Durham Center for Visual Arts and Culture. Uh, she's previously Director of the, the CRASH uh, Research Center at the University of Cambridge, and Professor of Visual Arts at the University of East Anglia. Uh, she is a prolific scholar, um, uh, her publications include uh, Defining Features, Scientific and Medical Portraits, 1660 to 2000, and The Look of the Past, Visual and Material Evidence in Historical Practice. But I know that many, many of you will know her from her uh, book, History and Practice, which has now uh, gone through um, three different editions, the latest uh, in 2019, and has really, uh, I suppose, replaced E.H. Carr's What is History as the, as the go-to manual for uh, what history is, what historians do, and some of the problems that we, and challenges that we encounter. And so it's entirely appropriate uh, that the village should be speaking today on the accountability of historians, a tremendously important and topical subject. So without further ado, uh, with huge thanks on behalf of the IHR, uh, I will hand over to Ludmilla. Well, Philip, thank you very much for that very kind introduction. Um, and I'd like to start by thanking Professor Joe Fox for the initial invitation to give this lecture in the summer of 2020. I chose the notion of accountability as one that inheres in all historical practice, whether it's called by that name or not. But my talk is now taking place on a different occasion, the centenary of the Institute for His of Historical Research. It, and it's not just its immediate context that has shifted. The wider world has also changed irrevocably. And I'm not only thinking of the pandemic here, Further, Joe is now leading London University School of Advanced Study in which the Institute sits. Thus, we might consider history with its multiple accountabilities within that broader landscape that is notable for its markedly fluid disciplinary boundaries. And I'm thinking of the Warburg Institute and the Institute of Classical Studies, for example. I'm grateful to Joe not just for that kind initial invitation, but for generously sharing with me her thinking about SAS and its future. And Philip Carter's help in drawing my attention to sources about the IHR in its early days is also greatly appreciated. So the centenary of IHR is a good moment to reflect on where historical activities sit in the wider world extending beyond academic settings. History's deep connectedness with every part of all our lives helps to account for the passion and commitment it inspires, as well as its manipulative uses in public life. This is not a new phenomenon. After all, IHR's first director, A.F. Pollard, stood for parliament three times, claimed history was directly useful to voters, and wrote extensively about contemporary politics. Although he was known as a historian of Tudor England, Pollard was what we would now call a public historian, deeply interested in the ways in which his historical expertise could contribute to debates about the First World War, the League of Nations, and the quest for war world peace, for example. He published pamphlets, wrote letters to the editor of the Times, 
and lectured far and wide during the Great War, as he put it, from Exeter to Newcastle on Tyne. And judging by his writings on contemporary events, he was a forceful rhetorician. The obituary in the Times observed, he quote, both taught and proved that history should be readable. If he was not a great writer, as Gibbon and Macaulay were great writers, the ordinary reader could and did enjoy even the most learned of his books. At the same time, he had a mission about the seriousness and importance of historical research that has left a profound and lasting legacy. So the context of the IHR's birth was one in which discussions about the nature and public value of historical research occurred. Pollard himself made some straightforward assumptions on these matters. And the precise manner in which he did so is a source of useful comparisons with the contemporary challenges historians face as we reflect on the Institute's future in SAS and on the wider national and international stages. I've chosen the notion of accountability together with a clutch of related ideas as a way in. While accountability is hardly the most glamorous instrument in the historian's toolbox, it may be a handy device, especially just now, when it underpins the fierce, intractable, inescapable conflicts about the past and its representations that are in the minds and hearts of publics, historians, campaigners, administrators, and politicians. Accountability and ethics are intertwined. Neither term is ideal. My concerns about the word ethics are twofold. One is its current association with administrative procedures, as in the university committees that those working with living participants seek approval from, and with organizations, as in codes of professional ethics, both vital, of course, but perhaps limited. The second is the proliferation of so-called applied ethics. And in the title of Peter Singer's hugely successful book, Practical Ethics, first published in 1979 with a second edition in 1993. Singer is sometimes said to be the most influential philosopher in the world. His writings touch on the treatment of animals, abortion, euthanasia, poverty and environmental issues, all important subjects. None of them, however, put historical practice center stage and existing arguments are not obviously transferable. And possibly applied is especially misleading in the case of history, where we are just as interested in ethical matters in the past, how historical actors understood them, acted upon, and possibly change them as in general abstract principles formulated elsewhere and then applied to historical cases. Now, accountability is open to some of the same charges as ethics, of course. So what follows is exploratory, thinking not just about one term, but about the related ideas, senses, and feelings that are present when we confront the heady mix of current events, difficult emo emotive topics, the challenges of participating in public life for those who identify as historians, and the need to show our workings. That is to demonstrate the constituent processes of historical work and not just to put it a bit reductively, results. In pursuing these lines of thought, it's helpful to recognize that accountability concerns not just relationships between people, but between historians and abstract ideas custodians, artifacts and their makers, citizens and values, public servants and those who appoint them, and many more. In the rest of this talk, I move through a number of sections, starting with accountability itself, then the ways in which recent events provide an opportunity to assess forms of accountability. I then return at the end to Pollard and his times. 
The contributions related fields and occupations can make through collaboration with historians is implicit throughout. And the importance of biography is a recurrent theme. So accountability. This is a concept that may be useful for now to think through some important issues for historical practice, which always has entailments in terms of peers and audiences. I'm not only concerned with historians narrowly defined, since those who earn their living in universities are just one constituency among many who can reasonably claim to be historians. They include genealogists and family historians, researchers for the media, full-time authors such as biographers, and many journalists, for example. So take the researchers for the uh, ITV's BAFTA-winning long-lost family programs. And I think in a moment, you're just going to see a screenshot about that. A new series of which started last week. Those who examine census, birth, death, and marriage records for such a high profile phenomenon are accountable in ways that are immediately obvious, and the tasks they undertake are manifestly historical. Furthermore, the effects of their research on those it most intimately concerns form a large part of the broadcast. In tracking down mothers who gave up their babies for adoption, the now grown offspring are desperate for an account of what happened and why they were given up. So accountabilities are there for all to witness. Changing values concerning, for example, teenage pregnancy and illegitimacy are invoked if not probed. I'm not passing judgment on the propriety of this venture, simply noting it as a telling present day phenomenon where accountabilities are performed, bringing historical research and the social, cultural and emotional dimensions of contemporary life together in striking and accessible ways. Historian is a fuzzy category as is accountability, with the diverse relationships it implies. In order to think about historians' accountabilities, some consideration has to be given to what I just now called peers and audiences, that is to publics, reach through acts of making public, whether TV programs or publication in journals, books, newspapers, podcasts, tweets, and so on. They also include minutes of meetings that are made freely available and record acts of judgment on matters historical. Asking for whom these forms of publicity and publication have been created, in what circumstances and who is exercising judgment leads towards accountability. As authors, we accept responsibility for the claims made for sources selected and interpreted, and treating others, whether informants, colleagues, funders, or research associates, appropriately. So much can be taken as read. I'd like now to rest briefly on a specific case that illustrates historical decision-making and accountability. So let me give a specific example concerning the National Portrait Gallery in London founded in 1856, funded in part by government, and set up as an arm's length body. Trustees are legally responsible for the institution. Most of them are appointed through a formal process in DCMS, that is Digiculture, Media and Sport, and number 10 Downing Street. And only they, that is only trustees, get to decide whether a sitter is of sufficient historical or contemporary and national significance for a representation of them to be admitted to the primary collection 
the largest such collection in the world. The judgment about contemporary significance could be described as proto-historical, in that it requires trustees to anticipate that any given individual significance is more than transitory. Minutes of trustees meetings are available online, so anyone can learn who was present and which portraits have been accepted at each meeting. What they can't see, however, are the briefing documents supplied by staff, that is, documents of historical research, nor can they see who was rejected, what works cost, and track the discussions, often heated, before a final decision is made. Dedicated research in the gallery's archives might yield some, but not necessarily all of this. A few of those making the decisions may be academic historians. David Canadine and myself, for example, a few years ago. Others write about the past outside the university system as authors. For example, Max Hastings and Claire Tomalin spring to mind. Yet others will have mainly enthusiasms, opinions, and commitments, as indeed do we all. The ways in which judgments are made are likely to be diverse. At the time of writing, there is no academic historian on the board, according to the gallery's website, although there is one art historian and one author, Peter Stoddart. The conservative MP Chris Grayling is also described as an author. The chair is David Ross, philanthropy, excuse me, philanthropist and donor to the Conservative Party. Jacob Rees Mogg is a trustee ex officio as leader of the House of Commons. There is huge public interest in the gallery. It is extensively covered in the media and members of the public often make contact to air their views. The passions portraits arouse is notable. In 1914, Mary Wood damaged John Singer Sargent's portrait of Henry James, painted the previous year when it was on display in the Royal Academy before entering the gallery following James's death in 1916. It remains unclear how much Wood knew about James. That is, thus, it is likely that portrait, that is a representation of a named identifiable subject, does a huge amount of work acting on this occasion as a symbol of authority. The NPG is one of the principal places where national history is given material form. It makes, whether through commission, donation, or purchase, icons. Accordingly, the forms of accountability present in the gallery really matter. They are totally historical, and those to whom explanations are owed include both government and the public, on behalf of whom trustees are also carrying out their appointments. Integral to the gallery's operations are, on one side, ideas such as nation, historical importance, celebrity, fame, reputation, and achievement. And on the other, delicate dealings with sitters, their loved ones, colleagues and descendants, art dealers, artists and their estates, donors, their expectations, motivations, and agendas. Further, audience research and commercial analysis are vital tools for assessing the visitor responses. Accountabilities are everywhere. The themes and challenges implicit in this micro sketch recur in the rest of my talk. And I hope this brief example hints at the current stakes and limitations around historians' accountability and historical accountability 
some of the conceptual intricacies involved when versions of the past course through the public realm and the value of showing our workings, which official minutes do not. Accountability then is not a simple concept. It has become freighted with negative associations through its role in audit cultures to invoke the title of an anthropological volume edited by Marilyn Strathern, which appeared in 2000. And it's critiqued, for example, by Stefan Kalini in Speaking of Universities, published in 2017, where his main concern is the use of metrics. It is also deployed in detailed analyses of the British state, for example, by Matthew Flinders. Now, these are not my focus, however, although I am commenting on historians' accountability in public settings. Rather, I hope accountability can act as a prompt for considering a clutch of issues around ethics, responsibility, and conscience, on the one hand, and the relationships between writers, including historians, policymakers, cultural leaders, audiences, politicians, readers, peers, co-workers, students, and so on, on the other. Tony Wright's definition of accountability should be noted here, quote, a relationship between an account holder and, a, and an account giver, so that the latter has to provide explanations to the former with the possibility of consequences. Wright writes as someone who was an MP for 18 years, now affiliated to UCL and Birkbeck, by virtue of his interest in government and public policy. Wright defines what we might think of as strict accountability, which is useful but only takes us so far in grappling with situations in which just about anyone can deem themselves entitled to hold historians and prevailing versions of the past to account. Moreover, both account holding and account giving passes through generations, as when political leaders offer apologies for wrongs committed before they were born by those with whom they may share little or nothing. So one of my questions is how do we think about accountability in more diffused situations? A closer understanding of contemporary media is certainly one route forward. And so is the study of institutions that mediate diffused forms of accountability, and museums are a case in point. Thinking through accountabilities in their more abstract form would be a project to undertake collaboratively with philosophers, lawyers, and political scientists. I'd like to dwell with accountability for a moment or two more. In the original version of Roger's Thesaurus, the word accountable comes up in three contexts, liability, accounting, and duty. Liability leads us in the direction of law. And I do indeed think that lawyers have much to offer historians through, for example, their work on public law. Accounting, narrowly defined, is the meaning that leads to audit cultures and metrics. For now, I want to rest with duty, not something historians talk about every day. Peter Mark Roger was trained as a physician and hence was familiar with the classifications of diseases. His thesaurus, and I'm quoting the subtitle now, was classified and arranged so as to facilitate the expression of ideas and to assist in literary composition. And it alerts readers, not just to cognates and opposites, but to the larger taxonomic structures within which ideas are located. So duty sits within class six, sentient and moral powers. Section four, moral, subgroup, obligations, which also includes right, dueness, and respect. 
So here being accountable is associated with being responsible and answerable, as well as with moral obligations in general. And this fluidity remains alive today. So we should be thinking of many types of accountability, ranging from the strictest forms that in historical practice include accurate, meticulous use of sources, avoiding plagiarism, and acknowledging the contributions of others to altogether more intangible obligations that may be couched in terms of respect for those we study, a desire to do them justice and give them their due. And all of these require fine judgments and they draw upon far more than historians' cognitive skills. However ubiquitous and well-worn they may be, these topics merit revisiting. It's in the very nature of accountability, as of ethical matters more broadly, that they must be constantly and critically reviewed, recast, revised, re-evaluated in conversations that are central to social, economic, political, and cultural life. As the philosopher Alastair McIntyre put it, and I quote, moral concepts change as social life changes. They are embodied in and partially constitutive of forms of social life. I find it somewhat ironic then that most histories of ethics focus on the ideas of leading figures over substantial chronological periods without regard to their contexts. But it is possible to read McIntyre's claims as inviting historians to show precisely how moral concepts and social life interact and change. Now, while historians have no automatic privilege to pronounce on shifting accountabilities, they do have skills, insights, and experience to contribute to the project implied by McIntyre's statement, as well as substantive materials, rich cases through which broader points can be exemplified and refined. Historians engage deeply with the context in which accountabilities are forged and deployed. Without such context being integrated into historical understanding of accountability practices, the concept risks becoming arid. It is possible to go further and assert that these topics must be continually and critically revisited, and not just by historians, but by all those with an interest in governance, legal processes, the conduct of public life, the distribution of assets and social justice. The work of the American moral philosopher, Diane Jesk, is an example of just such revisiting. She uses historical materials to foreground the contexts in which decisions about highly charged matters, including slaveholding, were taken. In a 2018 book designed for, the, for use in teaching and for non-specialist audiences, the Evil Within, which you can see in front of you now, she uses examples from the past to examine the capacity for doing terrible things and the extent to which that potential is present in all human beings. She therefore seeks in a given historical situation to show the choices that were available to historical actors. She starts, for instance, with slaveholders in Jefferson's time Contrasting Jefferson himself with Edward Coles, the two corresponded but took different views on emancipation. Coles freed his slaves, moved with them to Illinois, and set them up on farms that, were that they were able to purchase from him. She takes upon herself the burden of demonstrating past forms of reasoning, and also that there were indeed options. By doing this, she can more securely assign responsibility. Jesk's mode of arguing is historical and philosophical at the same time. She is interested in using perpetrators' accounts 
to prompt self-examination so that abstract issues become grounded. While she places individual accountability at the heart of moral philosophy, her broader aim is to give students and readers deliberative skills that enhance their capacity to become citizens capable of analyzing complex moral issues. Deliberative skills are integral to historical practice. Jesk is not pretending to be a historian, but her approach indicates potential synergies between history and philosophy built around accountability, moral concepts, and ethics. There are naturally enough parts of history where these themes already occupy center stage, where the wrongdoing is so intense that accountabilities in the past and now assume their most dramatic and challenging form, as in Holocaust denial. Richard Evans' book, Telling Lies About Hitler, The Holocaust History and the David Irving Trial, was first published in the UK in 2002, although a year earlier in the USA, for reasons he explains in his 2002 preface. These hinged on the extreme aversion of British publishers to the risks they perceived themselves to be potentially taking. That is, they eschewed such accountability. While that trial involved the very strictest kinds of accountability imaginable, for Evans, and I quote from his preface, seeing the camp survivors on the public benches in court was a daily reminder of the human significance of what we were discussing. So historians and survivors, historians and sources, historians and historians, these were the relationships that hinged on accountability. Regarding the same period, Daniel Goldhagen's controversial work is built around accountabilities in the past, the failures of individuals, groups, and institutions to enact them. And for him then, by extension, historians need to compensate by bringing such dereliction to public attention. I'm not endorsing Goldhagen's scholarship, I'm only saying that his work neatly illustrates a number of points around accountabilities. Naturally, there are many more episodes, many more historical episodes, that raise accountability issues in their starkest form. Concentration and internment camps and torture, for example, are after all widespread. So we might think of phenomena such as extermination, genocide, and war crimes as privileged zones that demand special attentiveness. But it would be a shame if an unintended result was a sense that moral questions were absent in other more seemingly mundane historical fields. Biographers face them all the time, as do legal historians. And those working with artifacts, archaeologists, curators, historical anthropologists, and so on. And I note that artifacts have the capacity to invest, it, sorry, sorry, I note that artifacts have the capacity to intensify accountability issues, especially when they represent named individuals and are located in public places. Controversies over figurative statues are profoundly historical. And at many levels, they allow feelings, symbols, sites, dominant narratives, local sensibilities, and myths about the past to intermingle. And while historians cannot resolve any conflicts that arise, they can help to disentangle what is going on and make common cause with museum curators, heritage specialists, art historians, and so on who find themselves caught up in so-called culture wars, which are usually history wars. Such wars are waged largely by the media, including by individuals on social media, with little regard to accountability issues. Museums and galleries easily become battlegrounds. 
my brief sketch of the government's governance of London's portrait gallery a few minutes ago was intended to indicate both the strict accountabilities that exist and also the less tangible ones, public opinion and the preference of trustees, for example. Such institutions, products of the past, which represent and embody the past, employ historians in many capacities. The symbolic power of galleries, museums, and their contents and displays is worth taking seriously. And in the next section, I address these issues more directly. So this section is called simply recent events. Now, my reflections have been profoundly influenced, not just by changes over the last 18 months, but also by the 18 years I've spent as a trustee of national museums, institutions where issues around accountability are now prominent and dramatically more so than they were even nine months ago. In the UK, they became increasingly intractable following the letter sent by the Secretary, uh, the Secretary of State of Digital Culture, Media and Sport in October 2020 to the chairs of trustees of arm's length government funded institutions about so-called contested heritage. And this letter is posted on the government's website for, for all to read. It invited them to respond, explaining how they would deal with the issue while asserting that contentious items should not be removed. Retain and explain has become a mantra. The letter was followed by a demand communicated through civil servants that on appointment or reappointment for a second term, no more than two terms are allowed, trustees would agree to hold up government policy on contested heritage. It was already well known that the government was seeking to control trustee appointments far more tightly and on ideological grounds. So history lies at the very core of these developments, which sought to reorient existing forms of accountability in order to transform them into allegiance to specific government policies. Historians have a double interest here. One is explaining how such shifts occur and what they mean. The other is working out what their position is when they find themselves holding trustee appointments, making historically informed judgments under the current regime. And here I should be open about my own position. I would not accept a trusteeship under these conditions, which normalize crass partisanship and devalue the meticulous assessment of evidence and the deliberative skills that historians, like many others, place at the heart of their practice. Such changes in government, in governance, sorry, that's an important slip, such changes in governance and their ethical penumbra would, I think, form an apt historical case study for Alistair McIntyre's claims that I cited a few moments ago. These broader issues have been taken up in some parts of the press, including the Financial Times, known and admired for its careful, wide ranging international reporting on culture, and especially on the visual arts, collecting and art markets. A long and thoughtful article by Alex Barker and Peter Foster appeared in the Life and Art section of the issue for the weekend. 12th to the 13th of June. And this is my not very good um, mobile phone uh, uh, photograph. So this story was given prominence at the top of the front page of the main part of the newspaper with the headline that I hope you can see, the battle over Britain's history and a smaller one asking, who should shape it, the state or the activists. Now, I'm not certain who writes this text, 
but it strikes me as unfortunate given that the journalists in question are offering sensitive and well-informed commentary. And two problems stand out. British museums do not only house homegrown artifacts. The battle, if that is the right word, is not only about Britain's history, but about the kinds of accountability certain kinds of institutions exercise in relation to history, full stop. The use of shape is welcome since it conjures up active processes that include the writing of labels and panels, the production of publications related to displays and exhibitions, and the design and management of websites, now the main ways in which publics engaging with museum and gallery, in which publics are engaging with museum and gallery in collections and interpretations. But the polarity between the state and activists is profoundly misleading. And it plays into simplistic distorting, con distorted conceptions about the way history is generated. It also gets the politics wrong by presenting polar opposites and reductive forms of agency. From what I can tell, it is not some mon monolith, the state, that is acting here but a number of ministers egged on by such back, some backbenchers with the approval of number 10. The people on the front line, as it were, are actually the civil servants who are being required to enforce the policy. At the same time and publicly acknowledged, it is known that candidate social media presence is being scammed. The implication being that someone who was, say, an active member of the Green Party and tweeted accordingly would not be a suitable trustee if they were critical of government policy or of named politicians. Barker and Foster provide examples of individuals who are both in favour of and highly critical of these policies, which affect all potential trustees while putting historians and archaeologists in a particularly tough spot when they are using their honed professional skills to make judgments about the acquisition, disposal, and display of artifacts, judgments that do not rest on the policies of a specific administration. One interpretation of these developments is a suspicion of expertise. An area that Barker and Foster do not explore is the funding regimes um, of the, those museums that are under the wing of DCMS. Readers of the FT might be forgiven for thinking that they are fully funded by the government, but in fact of necessity they raise a considerable if varying proportion of their own funds. Thus in practice the forms of accountability involved are yet more complex than they appear and include elaborate targets that museums must meet. One major group is missing in these discussions. The staff of museums, whether, whether, they, are, whether they be curators, conservators, archivists, librarians, interpreters, or educators, they are valuable historical comrades. These people too are historians in a generous sense who along with everyone else, read, think, develop their skills and respond to the world around them. Questions of government and governance are important and fascinating, but so too are the ways in which history is actually produced. And it is worrying that an understanding of these diverse, drawn out and sometimes admittedly tiresome processes is not more widely disseminated. Integral to such understanding are the ways in which views of the past change, whether they are professional or popular in the media or in the more formal representations of museums. In his recently published book, The Ever-Changing Past, James Banner makes the striking claim that all history is revisionist history. I define Historical revisionism, he says, not simply as alterations in historical interpretation, 
but more specifically as any challenge to existing interpretations of any aspect of the past brought about by new evidence, new arguments, new perspectives, or new methods. His points can be applied to museums, as well as to all forms of history making, a point that becomes dramatically evident if we consider shifts in the ways biographies are written, for example, in a psychoanalytic age. Biography as a genre is absolutely central here, given that contested heritage generally rests on an assessment of a life. In the case of Henry Dundas, for example, whose statue adorns St. Andrew's Square, Edinburgh, it rests on detailed assessment and interpretation of his parliamentary behavior. Such assessments are then transferred to, projected onto an object, which in turn is made to speak to much bigger issues, and then as it were silenced, if eventually removed, when that removal is indeed a judgment on a life. It's fruitless and misleading to think these processes can be reduced to a tick for or against some unspecified general category of statues. To be historical is to deal with these lives and representations case by case. It is also to recognize that reputations change, building and monuments are pulled down, new ones erected, names altered, images idolized and defaced, and that these phenomena are centuries old. By the same token, so have webs of accountability shapeshifted. In the context we find ourselves in now, it is surely a vital historical project to explain why there is, in some quarters at least, such resistance to change, an, em an embrace of reductive binaries, a reification of some lives and of some ideas. So now we're going to go back to the 20th century, the early 20th century, so back to Pollard. It's natural that we keep wondering in this IHR centenary year, what would Pollard have made of all this? He certainly didn't hesitate to express robust opinions on contemporary subjects. Those involved in the early days of the IHR had an intense sense of their present moment, of the responsibilities of historians, of the public values of history. And three features of that world stand out to me. First, assumptions about the value, the uncontested value of doing contemporary history. Second, the ways in which scholarly, administrative and public tasks were blended over careers. And third, the confidence that public history was useful, sorry, that professional history was useful. As Pollard put it in 1920, when he emphasized that the projected school of historical research had, quote, an immediate and practical bearing upon our present problems and pre our present discontents. He made the case through the contribution that historical research could make to voters' decision-making. Like others at the time, he de deployed the idiom of the laboratory and explicitly compared historians with scientists. I interpret his use of laboratory to be a way of drawing attention to the seriousness of historical research, the need for a specific location to house it, and a particular understanding of the use of printed primary sources, which would be available in the lab. Pollard simply assumed that historical knowledge had public value. To the extent that an analogy with science was plausible at that time, there is an implication of testing and rigor that robust methods underpin historians' claims. His blueprint for a London-based school of historical research makes assumptions about expertise, professionalization, and the quality of knowledge that discussions of accountability need to consider. They lie at the heart of explorations of historians' accountability to the extent that our capacity to inform public life 
our historians' capacity to inform public life rests on honed forms of reasoning and of high quality expert knowledge gained through training and continuing scrutiny. Now, what there isn't here is any idea of co-production, which has been such a marked feature of recent times and which distributes rather than concentrates agency, authority and accountability. Further, Pollard believed that history had the power to teach lessons. His faith, his faith manifest in his pamphlet written just after the armistice, that based on his historical insights, he could demonstrate one main lesson that would lead to world peace. And this, of course, seems woefully wide of the mark 103 years later. For example, he said that Germany would not enter another, another war. However, we can admire the sweep of his arguments, his historical range, and what I infer was a duty he felt to speak to the pressing issues of his time. So Pollard articulated the idea that history has public purpose, or rather he assumed it to be the case. As Alex Green has shown, the relationships between the many kinds of historians and the types of accountability they experience and to which they are subject are intricate and vary lo with location. In the English speaking historical world of the early 20th century, some of the elements we are grappling with now, expertise, professionalization, and the quality of knowledge can be discerned, especially in the uses of science. What does not feature is the problem of what I would call translation. That is how precisely and in what form voters, for example, would acquire the knowledge relevant to their decision-making from professional historians. Pollard's 1918 pamphlet, to which I just referred, was published by OUP, but I don't know in how many copies or at what price. In a striking phrase, Pollard claims, history is the dossier of mankind and dossier is emphasized. Voters, such a formulation implies, can, should ex inspect that dossier presumably mediated by professional historians and absorb what they need. If historians, we can assume, are responsible for assembling the dossier, voters, Pollard insists, and I quote, are responsible for the results of their own votes at general elections. And he continued, a people get the government it deserves, and if a government makes mistakes, due to neglect of recorded experience, it is because democracy does not insist upon historical competence as a qualification for rule. I think we are entitled to give a hollow laugh at this point. But note the claim about democracy. Since formal, accountab since formal accountability mechanisms are widely invoked as in Tony Wright's words, again, intrinsic to democratic politics. Picking up on Pollard's use of dossier, the notion of history providing something like briefings for voters may be what he had in mind. Now, we can perhaps explain Pollard's confidence in history's capacity, not just to inform, but to underpin democratic politics by noting the role of historians in this period in policymaking and diplomacy. And I think a really neat example of this is James Thompson Shotwell, himself involved in IHR's foundation, according to his autobiography, and an early user, according to Guy Parslow's recommendations, sorry, recollections from his time working there for much of the 1920s, 30s, and early 40s. A prolific historian who spent most of his career at Columbia, Shotwell masterminded the mammoth economic and social history of the World War on which he was working in the 1920s when the IHR was in its infancy. Before that, he had contributed the article, History, 
to volume 12 of the 11th edition of the Encyclopedia Britannica, published in 1910. And I thought this was a handy and revealing way of addressing conceptions of history around the time the Institute was founded. In some ways, Shotwell's contribution covered familiar ground in its coverage of ways of writing history from the earliest times to the present day, pay paying due attention to the critical analysis of sources, whilst also exploring issues around science. And I'm quoting Shotwell here, history itself, this double subject combined, begins with the dawn of memory and the invention of speech. In Shotwell's prose, the phrase, the science of history, the claim that physics is a branch of history, the implication that historians too are men of science, all seem quite natural. What he deplores is the use of history to mean, quote, the thing to be recorded, which he deems confusing. Hence his emphasis in the art, sorry, hence his emphasis in the article on its original meaning of inquiry and statement, the description and record of this universal process of ceaseless change. That, that's all his words. The way he expresses the point indicates that history is about everything and underpins everything. Now, Shotwell's life and career, especially his engagement with organizations such as the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace and the beginnings of the United Nations, suggest a kind of seamlessness between him being a historian and an active participant in public life, which can be used to assess comparable roles in recent times. Shotwell occupied a number of positions on US government committees from 1917, he offered advice and historical briefings whilst also advocating for world peace through collective security and neutrality laws. He was not a pacifist, but was nominated 19 times for the Nobel Peace Prize. One way of reading his multiple allegiances and roles is that they were saved, as it were, by a widely shared assumption that historical expertise is strongly empirical, that his advocacy was evidence-based, and that it was perfectly proper for him to put forward specific proposals as he did after both world wars. Witness, commentator, advocate, participant. It's no longer possible, I think, to just for historians to just reach for the sources, to simply insist that their own and their fields, to insist on their own and their fields rationality but we can assess our own capacity to perform such roles by inspecting instances such as Shotwell's from a certain distance. And in performing these roles, Shotwell navigated multiple accountabilities to politicians, bureaucrats, fellow experts, to charities such as Carnegie, to his conscience, which led him to his work for international peace, and to his profession, employer and students, as well as to his many readers. He was an incredibly prolific writer. And we are moving towards the end here. So the combined visions of career and the combined visions and careers of Pollard and Shotwell certainly have resonances a century later. Now their writings could all too easily be treated as episodes in a history of ideas that examines thinking about the nature and purpose of historical activity, separating historical activity from current affairs and the life of institutions, including their administrative tasks, which I suggest are not to be divorced from their aspirations and styles of working. Projects focusing on historiographical thought possess considerable interest and may be found in the huge historiography of historic historiography that now exists. In addition, paying attention to institutions and careers and to all aspects of historians' lives, insofar as this is possible, is invaluable. And I note that there's been a, a surge in recent times in biographies and memoirs of historians. I'm thinking, for example, of Michael Bentley's Page Turner, The Life and Thought of Herbert Butterfield, History, Science and God from 2011, 
David Hayton's riveting book on Lewis Namia from 2019, Gillis and Banner's edited collection, Becoming Historians from 2009, and the memoirs, the two volumes of memoirs by Saul Friedlander, 1978 and 2016, and by Benedict Anderson, the memoirs of Benedict Anderson from 2016 too. Now Pollard himself spent nine formative years working at the Dictionary of National Biography. He was politically active, although this is either not commented on at all, or mentioned only in passing in the, in the accounts of him that I have read so far. Making comparisons between our own times and 100 years ago helps us to discern both differences and similarities that contribute to articulating our vision for the rest of the 21st century. And in moving now really to the end of my talk, let me draw out just two. First, I see no evidence that either Pollard or Shotwell was scolded for their activities in the public realm. Being a historian might thus be thought wholly compatible with being his politically active, analyzing current affairs and advocating specific policies in the, in the interwar war period. But it seems to me that a century later, this is no longer really the case. Perhaps I have stated the contrast too starkly but we still need to ask about some key changes and how they happened. And I'm struck by the contrasting views in what it is to be a fully adult citizen that I think are present in this shift, which is present too in the governance issues I mentioned earlier, which find no room for the contributions that historians specifically might be able to make. It's precisely in this context that I note the capacity of a moral philosopher such as Diane Jesk to set out a deliberative mode into which historical understanding is integra integrated and is applicable to all citizens. And it is worth considering what a public conversation about historians' roles could yield that go beyond the interventions of a small number of star historians, useful though these may be. Second, I see biography as not only a major historical genre, but as a generative zone to be occupied by many kinds of historians, one that has considerable potential in our present moment. At the time Pollard was working for the DNB, there was great interest in the portraits of those included, sometimes discussed in the body of the entry. One of the most pressing contemporary issues is the figurative, representation is, is figurative representations of individuals, that is portraits. And the problems are wider than protests around specific statues associated with slavery. Think for instance of recent reactions to the statue of Diana, Princess of Wales. Given the tight connections between lives in words and lives in materials, and the need for fresh thinking about figurative representation, public art, commemoration, and memorialization, the Institute of Historical Research, inspired by Pollard himself, is ideally placed to lead such initiatives in a manner that does not shy away from their controversial nature. He was, according to one obituarist, a great individualist, and individualism, along with the reification it sanctions, lies at the heart of many contemporary conflicts. So we might think of the um, welding together of Churchill, Churchill statue and World War II, for example, which has come up recently. The Institute's location in SAS offers rich opportunities for the kinds of wide ranging interdisciplinary collaboration that are implicit in this talk. IHR's role in training historians allows it to experiment with many ways of becoming a historian in its most generous sense. Whilst the return of history and policy to IHR affirms the importance of collaboration with those working in government in a range of roles from MPs and ministers to civil servants and advisors. An understanding of the many kinds of accountability can be built into this, 
from the kind of work that Matthew Flinders and Tony Wright do through diverse approaches to governance and moral philosophy to the emotionally charged and media driven accountabilities in which we are close to drowning. So affirming the IHR's intellectual ambitions and public purpose is, I think, a great way to wish it happy birthday. Happy birthday. <laughs> Ludmilla, that's, that, that was a, a wonderful birthday wish and a great birthday present for us. And we're, we're very grateful. It was a, a wonderfully wide ranging and thought provoking lecture. I'm sure there'll be a lot of questions. Um, I mean, a, a quick glance through the participant list suggests that there are not only distinguished historians in this virtual room, but also politicians and policymakers, and sometimes people who wear a number of uh, different hats at different times. And if, um, if the politicians and policymakers would like to come in, you would be uh, very, very welcome to, to make an intervention. Uh, we already have some, uh, some questions in, in the, the chat, and I will feed those in. Um, but perhaps I could start with the prerogative of chair to ask a, a very quick question of Ludmilla. And it relates to Pollard's notion that uh, history could teach lessons. And I have a vested interest in this uh, notion, having just taken over as director of history and policy, uh, a very important project which has just moved back to the IHR where it belongs. Um, premised on the idea that the policymakers can learn lessons from history. But, but here's the problem, and you, you really um, touched on this in, in some of your opening remarks with Miller. You said that one of the responsibilities of historians is to show our workings. Uh, I was very taken by that phrase, because I think that as professional historians, when we read the work of our colleagues, we're almost more interested in the workings than in the answers. And that's maybe a little bit of an idealistic thing to say. Um, but when we interact with say journalists or policymakers, they tend to be only interested in the answers and in what they consider to be the right answers. Um, and again, I, I realize that that underestimates the sophistication with which many policymakers view history and, and, and arguably overestimates the sophistication of some historians when it comes to answers they don't like. But how do we overcome this, I suppose, this, this cultural divide when we do interact uh, with people outside the historical profession? Um, that's a, a very good question. Um, and I think the turn to governance, there's, there's a huge amount of commentary on, does offer one route forward because we know that people take note of governance arrangements. Um, and I, I really love to see historians really engage with governance issues and to be finding ways of speaking to different audiences about this. And actually, Philip, maybe history and policy is one of the places where we could be doing some of this. Um, but I think there are other ways of coming at it. Um, and one of it is, one of them is to, is to think about Pollard's notion of precedence. Um, so when Pollard thought he'd got the the answer to what to do at the end of World War I. It all hinged on a thing called De Parce Habenda from Henry II's reign, which he saw as a precedent for ways in which one could conduct business that could be extended to the life of nations. I think that's pretty interesting. And I do think there are ways that we could use languages around precedents. Um, I guess it's maybe philosophically a, a touch unrigorous, um, or it could be construed in that way. I mean, obviously Pollard didn't think it was unrigorous in the way he presented it in that pamphlet. Um, but I think there are languages that we that we could use. 
I mean, I do think there are other ways. One might be to make more common calls with lawyers where process, obviously, you, you know, I mean, law is static, but law is nothing if it's not also processual. It's not doing its job after all. So I just wonder if there are, those are some of the ways that we could open these things up. But I'd like people to think governance is exciting. And that it, it, it's a place where a lot of the most important stuff happens. Thank you very much. Um, now, we, we always like questions which historicize our historical problems. And uh, there's one from uh, Christopher Curry, who asks, is not the policy towards museums and their trustees discussed by Professor Georgianova uh, a restatement or reenactment of similar policies in historical culture warring under Mrs. Thatcher. Uh, would you like to respond to that? Um, to be honest, I don't think it, it quite is. Um, I mean, as I'm sure everyone on this call knows, I'm not a historian of 20th century Britain. Um, I've just been alive for half of it, uh, just over half of it. Um, my understanding is that Thatcher did not damage the notion of an arm's length body. Um, and actually, when I was first a trustee of the National Portrait Gallery, which was 2001, the government did not exercise its right to send an ex, ex officio member in the slot that Jacob Rees-Mogg occupies. Now I need to go back and check all the minutes, but I'm pretty sure that my my memory is correct on this. So um, obviously that was somewhat after Thatcher's time, but it, it, in the museum world, what has happened recently, I think is quite distinctive. And furthermore, it is not widely appreciated, I think. Um, and I think the FT journalists did a fantastic job and they're not the only journalists, but they're, so far as I know, I think The Guardian ran one small, I mean, there are people on this call who know, I think The Guardian ran, ran one article. Um, so I do see this as quite different. And I also have reason to believe that th they did this, um, although the letter from last October was on the government website, I think the making civil servants check every time, I think was not widely publicized. Um, and I'm not sure whether the great British public realized that people's social media accounts are scrutinized in this way, which does seem to me pretty extraordinary because it does imply that you, if you want a public appointment, you can't be commenting on the world as it is. There's, a, there's a, a, an intervention from uh, Jill Bennett, who of course was, was chief historian at the, at the Foreign Office for, for, for many years and, and uh, is a real expert in, in engaging with, with government. Uh, and Jill says, um, uh, I, my colleagues, aim, aim to improve policy making through advice to ministers. Would Pollard have agreed with that? Hmm. Do you know, I, I don't know the answer to that, and I think that's a very, very interesting question. Jill, if you want to, if you want to come back at any point uh, and uh, sort of uh, respond to that, do do come online. I don't put you on the spot. Oh, there you are. Uh, shall I? Shall I just yes. speak briefly, Philip? Yes, is, please. Um, yeah. Thank you so much for that really interesting lecture, First John Nova. I just. Um, and what Philip was just saying about showing your workings for historians like myself who've worked in government, that's precisely what you don't get the chance to do very much because ministers want half a side of A4 by mm. tomorrow mm. or this evening. And so it has to be the result, not the workings, even though, of course, you have to have done the workings. But you spoke very interestingly about Pollard talking about educating voters and educating the public. But what I'm thinking about is educating government, ed educating politicians, where it, it, 
insofar as obviously theirs is the decision. It is ministers who make decisions, not historians or civil servants, but our advice obviously has to form part of that. And I just wondered what you thought Pollard might have thought of that concept. Thank you. No, I think your points are absolutely spot on. And I've not seen any reference to this, but the Canadian who spent his life in the US, James Thompson Shotwell, I'm pretty sure we could answer some of those questions. Um, and I think if there are any IR people on the call, they will maybe think it's old hat to, re to mention Shotwell. Uh, but I found this extraordinarily interesting, partly because there's a fantastic book actually about one of the other sp specialists in the American government who was a geographer, and it's by someone called Neil Smith, and it's about this other geographer. And there you see much more of the workings that you're talking about uh, in terms of relations with, with civil servants. And so, but maybe there are sources that would enable us to, to get deeper. And I'm, I mean, maybe I should say, I'm absolutely not trying to set myself up as an instant expert on um, on Pollard. Um, there's a recent article by Paul Cavill at Cambridge on, on Pollard, which is very much about Pollard's work with history of parliament. Um, but I'm intensely interested in the role of the civil service, and perhaps I can confess, and this is because for a short time I was on one of the new honours committees when they were reformed. And when you're on one of those honours committees, you have to work with the civil servants. And I found that one of the most interesting things I've ever had an opportunity to do, which is why I'm so keen on history and policy and on the possibility, possibilities that this affords for opening up these kinds of questions. So that's the best I can do just today. <laughs> thank you, thank you very much. Um, this question, and, and I should say that uh, if there are any ministers or former ministers who would like to respond, the, the, um, the Floor is open to you if you want to come in. Uh, there's a question from Jeffrey Patterson, uh, who says, isn't there something of a conflict between academic history and the construction of collective memory, social memory, especially when the news media tends to source uh, the latter over the former? Okay, well, thank you very much. Um, I think it depends on what you mean by conflict. I think there are tensions in that we may be using different languages. We may be assuming different things. We may be taking different examples. But I feel a very, very strong commitment to the idea that there's a continuum, if that's even the right metaphor, between the many kinds of histories that are being produced because I just don't see the, the, the advantages in academic historians saying that we do something different. And in that sense, I think it will be good if everyone who has a job where they earn their living being a historian engaged with these questions and accepted that they could be, maybe even should be, a public historian as well as whatever the antithesis is, clearly not a private historian. So I think there are tensions, is the language that I'd prefer to use. But I think we have to, we have to explore the overlaps and relationships. And I think we shouldn't be afraid to get more involved. And, you know, my reference to star historians was not meant to be at all um, critical. On the contrary, you know, there are people like David Olasoga who, you know, bless him, something will happen. And the very next day, he's got a column out on it. And I just know, I, I, I don't know how to work like that. And maybe that's a job for history and policy that could encourage historians to, to find a voice more, but I'm very keen on, on bridging. And I do think the commemoration, memorialization and sort of more academic history, one of the bridges is museums. And that's why I'm so interested in 
more people participating in, in work with museums, which whatever we think about it, the impact gender agenda in the UK has really encouraged. Thank you very much. There's uh, a few minutes left if anyone wants to ask some final questions in the chat. Just while you're while you're thinking of some some questions, just uh, another one uh, for, for for me. I mean, Ludwilla, you you talked about um, one aspect of accountability being uh, apologies uh, for the past, and you you sort of said apologies by uh, by politicians who might have very little to do with. These, these past events or, or crimes. And um, I mean, a little while ago, we, we hosted a seminar in which Susan Neiman, who's written a very interesting book called Learning from the Germans, uh, took part. Uh, and, and Susan's argument really, as the, as the title of the book implies, is that the, the Anglo-American world should be more contrite about Things like slavery and colonialism, and should take should take a leaf out of the book of, of um, German of, of apologies for, for for the Holocaust. But I I, I, sus I suspect from your comments that you're more ambivalent about about this sort of contemporary trend towards uh, apologising for historical wrongs. Is that is that right? Well, I I, I think you're very perceptive. I think I I feel uncertain because I do worry that it's easy to say things without, without there being sufficient found foundations. And I've taught a couple of times in Germany in recent years. And one of the things that really strikes me is how sensitive they are about memorials. And so, you know, when I was in Bielefeld, for example, they had a only relatively recently erected a memorial to uh, women who were, um, I think, enforced workers in a factory. And to me that, to, and it was not, it was not figurative, which, and I think there's a real problem there. And I thought that was very much more meaningful than an apology, but I absolutely do not neglect the symbolism. And I have to say, I mean, if anyone knows the third edition of History and Practice, they'll know that I decided to end with a section on Hillsborough, which one of the editors said to me, oh, no one will be interested in that. Um, and I insisted uh, that it was put in. And I, I, I'm not, a, you know, I'm a complete ignoramus, but I found myself very touched by what, what happened since the, the final on Sunday and the questions of apologies. And I'm a bit of a fan of Marcus Rashford. And I think him navigating this question of how you apologize in public, what you do apologize for and what you don't apologize for is very, very interesting. So I, I absolutely don't want to diminish the importance of some of these public uh, sayings, but I want to see I want to see a kind of depth of engagement because I think, yeah. yeah. And, and I mean, this, this also relates to uh, Christopher Kreutz's uh, question. Are some of the issues faced by historians and civil servants today peculiar to the UK or is this a global problem? I think there are probably um, people on the school who are much better qualified than me to comment, but I would say I think the person in the world who writes best about this is Stuart McIntyre uh, in Australia. And he has constantly in publication after publication tried to engage with these questions. Um, and I really respect that, including, I think, a piece that perhaps would be useful, uh, Philip, in a history and policy context. It's in the History Wars, which was published in 2003. And then he did a second edition in 2004. And the second edition 
contains an afterword where he analyzes the way people responded to his arguments about Australian policy and Australian media and Australia accounts of the treatments of indigenous peoples. And he dissects exactly what happened. And I, I think this is a very, very powerful accounting. So I think in Australia, uh, there are some very comparable issues. Uh, I'm, I'm open to the possibility that like the obsession with portrait galleries, this may be something to do with the English speaking world. No one's ever come up with a satisfactory explanation about why national portrait galleries seem to be so much more important in the English speaking world than in many other parts of the world. So perhaps there's a project there. Um, thank you very much. Jordan Sly uh, uh, says your, your point about uh, that we should all be public historians is incredibly important. Uh, but do you think that the, the recent furore over the National Trust homes uh, and the confrontations around this, um, to paraphrase, um, uh, puts that into perspective? I mean, I suppose the uh, raises some questions about how we should actually do this. Uh, I suppose the, the sort of follow on question from that is that, is it worth all the hassle? You know, if you look at some of the uh, opprobrium that was poured on historians uh, associated with the, the colonial countryside project, um, is that going to ward, warn historians off getting involved in the public sphere? Fantastic point. So I'll try and be quick. Um, I deliberately didn't mainly focus on the slavery issues because I wanted to show that these, they come up in a whole range of contexts. I think it's quite important that we do all keep saying, and this is in the spirit of Pollard and Shotwell, you know what, there are archives. We go to the archives, we can tell you. And I, I think there's a real moment here where we can valorize the, the richness of archives. I've done quite a, a bit of work in the Churchill archives in Cambridge. And in fact, I was allowed to see some really interesting material about Thatcher, which because it had been in, in an exhibition I was given access to. I have to say that you know, that kind of access I think can have a radical effect on how you think. It's not news in the history world that Churchill was quote, a racist. Um, and I think if every historian, I, you're gonna think me perhaps a bit naive, but I think if every historian wrote, let's say every professional historian in the UK wrote at least once a year to their local MP, maybe to more MPs saying, gosh, you know, Here's the evidence about this, and I'd be delighted to help you think about it. I think it's worth doing. So I think there are ways we can do it without the opprobrium, but I think we should hear it for the riches of the archives and the way they can inform public life, because I think that's something that, that people, I, I don't mean, it's, I, this isn't coming out quite how I intended. Let me, let me try that sentence again. <laughs> I think the riches of the archives are something that people can have, feel an affinity with. As, yeah. And that that is one tactic we should use. I mean, I'm not on Twitter. Um, maybe I should be. But I don't think Twitter is the only way. And I do think trying to talk to more groups of people and, and starting those conversations and maybe using archives and libraries as a jumping off point might be one strategy. And I think archivists and librarians are very keen to be doing this. Thank you very much indeed. I mean, we, we, we got to the end of our allocated time. Um, the IHA hasn't been doing an awful of merchandising around its centenary. We've got a, a bright new logo. It did occur to me after listening to Ludmilla that we should maybe think about having a, a centenary t-shirt which just has what would Pollard have done on it. 
and um, walk around the streets of London, see if anyone uh, understands that. It, it, but, but this has been one of the questions recurring throughout the pillars uh, remarks. And as I say, it's been just a, a wonderful uh, sweep of, of some of the kind of the issues that we, we deal with as historians, some of the particular challenges that we face now and the echoes of challenges that historians have faced in the past. And um, this has been, as I said before, just a lovely birthday present for us, Ludman. I'm so pleased that we've been able to record this and that we've been able to make the recording available. I'm sure it will be, uh, attract huge interest uh, amongst historians, policymakers, politicians mm -hmm. alike. So thank you, thank you so much, and thank you all for joining us, and thank you for your for your questions. Um, thank you, Philip. It's a real honour to to be in this community, and again, wishing IHR every success in the coming centuries. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you all. Good good evening.